Thank you, Mahmoud. Uh, going to shift gears just a little bit. We're still talking about manure sampling, but where Aaron put the emphasis on sampling uh, predominantly dry manure in the beef settings, uh, I'm going to be talking about sampling liquid manures in holding ponds, in particular swine uh, holding ponds. And But if you pay attention to what I say, you'll find a lot of duplication in basic concepts that Aaron covered. And in fact, Mark Rice will cover some of those as well. So as the title says, we're going to be dealing with sampling uh, holding ponds. And the focus on this really goes back to the question of well, why are you sampling? Uh, if you're going to do something, it's nice to know why you're doing something. And with manure sampling, predominantly the two reasons you're doing the sampling is to address crop nutrient concerns. Is your receiving crop getting the nutrients they need? And the second is, are you addressing potential water quality concerns? So what I'll be talking about is kind of an overview of the concepts and the options in this. See if I can get my screen to move forward. There we go. Well, one important question really to start this whole process off is what really determines a manure application rate? Is it the amount of land you have? Uh, is it what? The says in your nutrient management plan, uh, what about your available equipment? How much manure do you have to apply? Uh, manure concentrations, economics, available time and labor, neighbors' nose, uh, climate, weather conditions, regulations. What about what the crop needs? Soil nutrient supplies nutrients. Does that need to be considered? Uh, what are the influence of your facility's design? And that may be the facility for your housing for your animal, to your manure management, to uh, other factors. Personal preferences, does that go into application rates? What about your target crop production? Water quality concerns? So obviously, all of those have some interaction with what eventually becomes your target uh, manure application rate. And you can also see it's a little bit of a juggling act because those things at times are in competition with each other. And what a lot of them tie back to are the characteristics of the manure that's going to be applied. And when I say characteristics, I'm talking about both the physical characteristics about what it looks like, how it moves or flows, things like that. But I'm also talking about the chemical characteristics in terms of what's the nutrient concentrations within it, and if you're concerned about from a, a micro, um, micro perspective or a pathogen perspective, that would be a characteristic as well, but I won't deal with that much in this presentation. The other thing we need to remember is just as Aaron said earlier, uh, manure varies. It varies every time you turn around, and if you really think about it, it goes all the way back to the initial situation of what is the animal population that you're working with. Is it cows, pigs, chickens, turkeys? Uh, what demographics within the animal species? How many farrowing animals do you have? How many boar? How many finishing hogs do you have on site? So that goes into your manure characteristics determination. Then you get your pre-excretion practices. And really what I mean when I say pre-excretion is what do you do that affects the animal before that animal excretes manure, that affects the manure characteristics. And typically you think in terms of feed, but animal health also plays a role in that as well. Uh, then you get into the post-excretion practices and that becomes easier to identify because essentially every time you add moisture, you take moisture away. Every time you collect the manure or you transport the manure, uh, or you let the manure just sit by itself, or you do some kind of active treatment process, you change the characteristics of that manure. On the screen, you will see that there are four sample bottles, and this is an example of the variability that can take place on one farm with two different storage units. This particular farm, all four sample bottles were collected on the same day. This particular bottle is actually was taken from the only true lagoon, a uh, design lagoon in the state of Arkansas that I'm aware of. And you can see that it is a very light brown color. 
And this is just the supernate, the top water on that lagoon. And this was pretty early in the uh, usage of the lagoon. So there wasn't much, for lack of a better word, strength to the material being uh, in that lagoon. The other three bottles were collected in the settling basin, which is in line prior to the lagoon, where the manure flows from the barns into the settling basin, and the solids tend to settle out, and the water tends to flow through. Well, in this first bottle, this is the supernate, or the top water for the settling basin. If you look at the bottom, it's pretty dark, but you can see where it gets a little bit lighter in color up at the top. The third bottle is a composite sample where we're measuring from the top of the pond all the way to the bottom of the settled solids. And if you look on it, it's a lot darker in color and you see much less lighter coloration at the top. And the final sample is that manure settled solids or the sludge at the bottom of the pond. And it, as you look at it, you'll see that it is a looks to be a fairly homogeneous a mixture, you don't see any light at the top. If anything, you see look, a little bit of an air bubble bubbling stuff right there. So you can see just from that on a single farm, two different storage units, and even within a storage unit, you get variability in your manure. Looking at it from a different perspective, this sample, the numbers here are from three samples that were collected from a single storage unit on a single date from a different swine farm. Again, it was, this was a holding pond. And the samples collected were the top water, the entire column, which is from the top of the water all the way down to the bottom of the sludge, and then the settled solids, which is just the bottom portion, or the, the settled solids material. And what we analyzed, or what I'm reporting here, are the percent solids, the total nitrogen, the total phosphorus as P2O5, total potassium, and also the nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. And if you'll notice that for the percent solids, the top water has very little percent solids, less than 1% solids. Whereas the composite sample was about 4% solids, so that's a significant increase. But when you get down to those settled sludge at the bottom, it was running a almost 14% solids. A significant difference within the distance of eight feet because that was the total depth of the, of the structure. If you look at the total nitrogen, you'll see that as you move from the top water down through the entire composite, down to the bottom of sludge, the nitrogen concentration increases as you go down the, the uh, column. And the same is true for the phosphorus, it goes down. Notice there's a difference in the trend or the magnitudes at which those concentrations build up. Potassium is different than nitrogen and phosphorus in that it tends to be pretty uniform uh, throughout the entire column. Now these trends, I see those repeatedly from pond to pond. So there'll be variations in that, but that trend holds, tends to hold true. And that trend actually creates a problem or solves a problem depending on how you want to view it. And what I'm getting at is if you're interested in a homogeneous mixture for land application to all of your fields, that means you need to agitate that pond to get that uniformity of material to land apply. On the other hand, if you're looking for different types of manure with different fertilizer characteristics, this gravity settling provides you an opportunity to pick the appropriate manure to apply to the field in question. Uh, kind of point that out a little bit, let's look at the nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. If you've got a field that's up close to your barns and it tends to be pretty high soil test phosphorus because it's routinely received manure in the past and the phosphorus is built up and now you're concerned about how much additional phosphorus you can apply to that field before the phosphorus index or whatever mechanism the state uses to set the acceptable rates. Say no more manure to this field. Really what you're wanting to do is meet the nitrogen needs while not oversupplying the phosphorus needs of the crop. And the NP ratio for forages tends to need, tends to be two and a half to three or higher is really what you're looking for. 
That's what you get with this top water. With the bottom sludges, look at that. That NP ratio is less than one, which means that you're putting, for every pound of nitrogen you're putting out there, you're putting out two pounds of phosphorus. And that's obviously not the direction you want to go if you're concerned about phosphorus on that field in the immediate application. But it does provide an opportunity to say, I've got a field farther from the farm where I can haul this lower water content material that's higher in concentration of nutrients, and I can make an application this year that ought to carry me over for a couple of three years. And that way you're applying every second or third year and meeting the long-term nutrient balance that you're after and saving transportation costs. Incidentally, if you want to look at these numbers a little different way, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the fertilizer rec ratios that are for the different types. For top water, it was a 414. The entire column is 211, and the settled solids is 351. Another way that I'd like to show you the variability of manure to really kind of drive home the point that we need to be thinking in terms of collecting good samples representing what is going to be applied, is these numbers that you see on the screen here were extracted from a database that contains manure analysis that were submitted to the University of Arkansas's lab from 2005 to 2010. Um, I extracted the numbers that you see and they represent the max, min, and average values for broiler litter, pullet litter, liquid dairy manure, and liquid swine manure. And don't get too wrapped up in what the actual numbers are. Look at the trends. And the main trend I'd like to call your attention to is the spread or the range between the max and the minimum values. Uh, for broiler litter, on the percent moisture, it ran as low as nine to as high as 67% moisture for dry bedded bulk boiler. The average was about 30, which is, I think is probably a little high for an average, but I think what this points out is it's possible to have manure that's way out of range of what your average value is. So if you apply a material based on averages and you really are out of range or away from that average, the question is, are you really over applying by a significant amount or under applying by a significant amount of material? Uh, the implications are completely different if you're concerned about agronomic uh, versus uh, environmental. Another possible uh, example to point this out is with the liquid swine manure. Uh, those of you who have worked with liquid swine manure and you look at this and you say, 33% solids? It comes out of the pig at about 10% solids. How are you going to get 33% solids on uh, swine manure? I think what we're getting there is ponds that were being closed out. So the bottom sludge was drained, stockpiled on the side of the pond, allowed to drain some more, and then sent in for analysis. So you get a percent solids to 33 percent solids and I think that same process explains how you can get 256 pounds of P2O5 per thousand gallons of material. So again it's not typical but it points out the variability that you get from farm to farm to farm. So all this leads into some basic key concepts uh, regarding sampling. Uh, at times, you've got no choice but to use a book value. I mean, if you're doing, if you're developing a plan and an application rate for a farm that does not have uh, manure yet, or if you're dealing with a farmer who will be buying manure from different sources, I uh, got no choice. You've got to be working with book values. But sampling is recommended. It also means we need to be getting samples that have meaningful values for what the manure is going to be used for. If you're going to apply top water to field A, you need to be sampling top water for field A, and the bottom sludge going to field B, you need a sample for that as well. Uh, Aaron covered the options of sampling before and before the application is made or after the application is made. Uh, in Arkansas, we tend to do our 
sampling processes in advance of our applications for planning purposes. Uh, it seems to work uh, better for us. Uh, the other thing that uh, Aaron did mention is an advance uh, the advantages of doing your sampling beforehand is at least with the holding ponds and manure storages, uh, you can go get your sample in advance and you don't have to worry about getting distracted from your application process during your, uh, by doing your sampling. It kind of separates things out and it, you do have the opportunity to sample in advance uh, of your event. The other thing I'd like to emphasize with the, as a key sampling concept is you need to know why you're collecting your sample. Are you trying to determine the total amount of nutrients in your storage unit, or are you trying to determine the nutrient concentration of the type of manure that you're going to be applying to a particular field? And a final comment that I'd like to make is whenever we are doing sampling or we're doing anything on a farm, we can't fit forget biosecurity. Uh, so consider this a plug for the December biosecurity webinar. Okay, so we've gone through the key concepts. Now we really need to be thinking about what do I need to know to do my planning process so that I know how to collect my samples? What tools do I need? What information do I need to make those determinations? Well, the first thing I think you need to know is what are the management practices for the storage units? You know, how are those storage units managed and how does that have an influence on the manure? And that ties into the second point of, we need to know how that manure, the manure traits for the manure that's in that storage unit. You know, if it's gonna be dry manure, then you're gonna collect it in a different way than you do a liquid manure. Really high solids content manure is gonna be different than trying to get a sample from the a lighter solids content liquid manure. The other thing we need to be thinking about is, what is the beneficial use or the agronomic application and or disposal concerns. What are we concerned about in terms of over application, under application? And again, I wanna hit the point that we need to, you need to be thinking about, are you trying to determine total nutrients in the storage unit or are you trying to determine what's the concentration of the manure that's going to be applied? And again, the concept of when you're gonna do your sampling, before or after. And I've got the figure there of the couple of guys kind of playing tug of war with the puzzle pieces. I think that's kind of key to the concept of knowing in advance what you're sampling, why you're sampling, and thinking about how you're gonna go about the process of sampling. The focus for this discussion is I'm gonna be looking primarily at holding ponds. And I, and I think there may be some crossover for in-house pits and things like that, but that's, I don't deal with the in-house pits a lot. It's mostly the holding ponds. But in the sampling process, we're looking at determining what the crop nutrients needs are, and that's really determined by the soil test recommendations. Uh, again, we're trying to plan in advance. Uh, the water quality protection concerns, uh, obviously we don't want to exceed the nitrogen recommendations for the crop, uh, and nor do we want to apply phosphorus at levels that are excessively risky to the environment. And in Arkansas, we tie that back into soil test P levels. And as the, I have research has shown that as those levels go up, the risk of runoff goes up. And we also use the phosphorus index in the planning process that considers not only the soil test P levels, but the total P in the manure that will be applied and the water soluble component of the water soluble phosphorus in the component in the manure that would be applied. And the sampling, as I indicated, we tend to be thinking in terms of the nutrient management plan, the application rates that are tied up in that nutrient management plan, and the development and the ongoing refinement of those plans. Okay, um, I this talk is giving me an opportunity to kind of climb up on my soapbox. Uh, the perception out there or the uh, portrayal maybe is that every time you dig a hole in the ground and you put manure in it, you have a lagoon. Uh, as an engineer, that gives me some heartburn 
because earthen storages can be largely divided into holding ponds and lagoons, and they are engineered and designed structures that are sized according to the amount of manure that's going to be going into it and rainfall and storm volumes. And holding ponds and lagoons are similar, but there is a very significant difference between them. Both have a free board volume. Both have a 25 year, 24 hour storm volume. Both have a volume dedicated to the normal pre precipitation amounts for the storage life of the structure. Both have a manure storage component and both have a settled solids component. The holding pond does not have and the lagoon does have a design treatment volume designed to change the characteristics of the manure. And I'm gonna leave that alone. I think Mark Rice will cover that in a few minutes. When you look at a holding pond management and the, the layers of storage in, in that, the freeboard is that space above the maximum water level that will ever exist that is put in to help prevent overtopping of the embankments. And this really, you can think of the free board as something that was implemented to protect the pond. The 24, 25 year, 24 hour storm volume is that rainfall event that you would occur basically every 25 years. And it's not supposed to be used routine. It should be empty most of the time. And the only, whenever you do have such an event, the idea is you pump it out and retain that capacity as soon as you can. And what that leaves for a holding pond is for the, <clears throat> the precipitation, the manure storage and the settled solids of uh, management. And those are designed to be completely removed during at the end of the storage period for the holding pond. Typically that's 180 days. And the traditional method or recommendation for holding pond removal was you come in, you thoroughly agitate with pump agitators or prop agitators, and you'd mix the material up into a homogeneous mixture, and you would then apply this homogeneous mixture to all of your fields at the appropriate rates. Uh, that is a valid option uh, if that matches the crop nutrient needs for the receiving fields. An alternative approach would be to come in and pump the top water off and apply it to closer fields where you want to maintain uh, that nitrogen phosphorus ratio in your crop and you want to re uh, be able to keep that field available for long-term applications. And then come in with a separate process or after you get the top water pumped off where you agitate, resuspend those subtle solids and you apply those to the fields that you can apply the heavier solids to. Uh, the key concept with the holding pond management is whatever you do, make sure that you completely empty that structure at least once a year so you don't have nutrient carryover from one year to the next year. Uh, having a nutrient carryover really plays havoc with your nutrient planning and your water uh, environmental protection components. Pond sampling pointers. Uh, if your pond is going to be agitated, collect samples from the top, middle, and bottom of the pond and then blend. Uh, I see the video there, Mahmoud, I'll get to it. Uh, otherwise, you need to collect your sample from the zone you'll be pumping. And boil it down to, if you're going to apply top water, sample top water. If you're going to apply a homogeneous mixture, sample a homogeneous mixture. Uh, recommend sampling at least eight sam samples around the pond. Uh, if you're collecting from a boat, uh, collect eight that way. I do not normally recommend boat sampling personally because of the extra uh, personal uh, risk associated with getting a boat out there and collecting samples, but that does give you a little better sample. Uh, <coughs> and we've done those advantages and disadvantages. Once you've got your manure samples together, you need, you need to mix several subsamples together, those eight subsamples in a bucket and mix. Uh, from that, you fill your sample bottle up to half to three quarters full. You need a gas space on top. Uh, you don't want the mailman having a jar blow up on him. And 
the next bullet point says get the sample to the extension office. Uh, that works good in Arkansas and North Carolina. We were told that gets the uh, Nebraska extension office secretary is kind of upset with you. So you need to make sure whether you mail the samples in yourself or if you deliver them to a, a county office. And you need to have the correct analysis done for what you're trying to do the work with. Uh, the numbers and the analytes that uh, Aaron mentioned are good ones. In Arkansas, we would add uh, water extractable phosphorus to the mix. The other thing I'd like to say is when you mix those samples together and you pour it into the jar, do that very, very quickly because those solids will settle out very rapidly. The sampling options, one option is simply a cup or a bucket strapped to the end of a stick. You can scoop off the top water. Uh, if you think about it a minute, you can actually get um, middle water and bottom samples as well by holding that container upside down, then scooping and rotating it so it lets the air out and the water in. Uh, the thing with these samples is not only are you sampling representative depths, you've also have to start worrying about representative volumes from the depths. Another sampler option you see recommended is essentially the concept of a ball on a string and a push rod. Uh, this particular example is six feet long. It's not going to be long enough. Uh, the other thing is I haven't used these. Uh, I just haven't been, I, I would be interested in folks' thoughts on how well they, uh, convenient they are to seal. Third sampler option, and actually the first, the previous one and this one, and the one from here on have the advantage that it allows you to collect entire water column samples if that's what you need to do. Uh, this particular sample, as you can see, is a ball at the end connected to a rod that goes at the other end so that you can open and close this valve as you want to. Uh, and these type of samplers, uh, will probably work just fine as long as the manure flows well. If the manure stops flowing well, it won't flow around the ball and all this extra hardware to get in the tube. And I think that can cause some problems. Uh, here's an example of a sludge judge. Uh, same kind of concept, except it's got a little ball sampler, uh, floating ball there. It's the same thing. If the manure flows, it'll flow up the tube just fine. If it doesn't flow, it's not going to. I'm hurrying up. Uh, this diagram here is one that I worked on uh, early in my career when I first started pulling some samples and before I got really concerned about solids. Is basically the same thing as a sludge judge, but I was using uh, PVC pipe because it was cheap and I was using flapper valves because they were cheap. And you put the flapper valve in there and you lower it in so the water would flow up. And when you lifted the rod, the water would hold the valve closed. Then you could pour it out your bucket. Works great when the manure flows. When it doesn't flow, it doesn't work. Uh, these materials on the end can be left off. And the last uh, slide I'd like to put an emphasis on is Really the sampler that I've come to like the concept of best of all, I've used clear PVC pipe because I'm uh, enough of a geek, I wanna see what I'm doing. But it's standard PVC, clear PVC pipe, just a standard ball valve, replace the regular T handle with some kind of extended handle, and I can open and close that valve as I need to. Uh, this picture here is one that I finished up just a couple of days ago. You'll notice that I replaced the uh, lever arm in a pipe with a piece of uh, high density polyethylene uh, in a triangular form and a bit of string. It just, I find it easier to control and you can just, has your 90 degrees of rotation allows you to open or close that valve as needed. And this is the original uh, valve. I trimmed the bottom off uh, to get you, so you're sampling all the way down to the bottom of the pond. And I like to use the single union valves because that allows you to take it apart, clean it, and also gives you some control on how hard it is to open and close that valve. But what I like about this sampler is if I want to sample the entire column, I just leave it open and insert it into the manure. And when I get down to the bottom of the pond, I just close the valve and I've got the entire column there for the subsample. 
If I want to sample the top water, push it in a little bit with the valve open, then close it. If I want middle column, insert it closed, open it, close it, and then I've got the middle column. If I want the bottom sludge, close it, settle it down to the bottom sludge, open it up and push it in, close it off, and I've got the bottom sludge. It's one sampler that gives those. Thank you, Carl.